am Ram. And I am Cork. And together we are... Ram and Cork. We want to welcome you to an edition of Coffee and Conversations. And this morning we have a very illustrious gentleman here with us. And I would save his name for last, but I'll tell you a bit about him first. Successful is one of his main things. But he's results driven in the insurance industry. An executive who has worked across all business segments within the financial services industries over the past 30 years. He has extensive knowledge and experience in leading high performance teams in the insurance and banking sectors across the English Dutch speaking Caribbean. He has proven success in implementing and executing business strategies for large regional financial institutions across 17 countries mm. and worked with JP Morgan, one of the leading and largest banks in New York, USA. And Coffee and Conversations would like to today welcome Executive Vice President and General Manager, Sajikor Life Inc. Barbados, Mr. Paul Innes. Welcome. Thank you, Rum and Coke. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, first of all, uh, we want to know what originally got you into your current field of work. Uh, interesting question. Uh, so I actually wanted to be an accountant. An accountant. A lot of people don't know that. Um, I had a, a real drive and desire to become an accountant, mm -hmm. primarily because uh, from school I did business subjects. Mm. And I found I had a love for principle of business and accounting and that type of stuff. So it was natural for me um, from an academic perspective. All right. Uh, but you'd be interested to know that um, I actually wanted to be a musician. A musician? Uh, yeah. All right. I, if I had to live all over again and um, could have redo what I'm doing, I probably would have been a musician and not be working. Would you have your own band or? Uh, I'm not sure how it would evolve, but uh, <laughs> my vision of myself was to be a classical clarinetist. So oh, I studied nice. clarinet at school, um, and that was really a very difficult instrument, uh, technical instrument. Mm -hmm. And um, as I got older, I realized I like challenges. So the clarinet for me was a challenge mm -hmm. because you see all these various keys, and how do you master these keys to mm -hmm. actually present, um, create a sound? So. Uh, when I realized music couldn't happen the way um, mm -hmm. I wanted, uh, I actually uh, went and work. Ended up working at uh, Haywoods. Mm -hmm. uh, you might be too young to know Haywoods. I can remember uh, Haywoods. I remember. So Haywoods is <laughs> that was your first, first job. Yeah, my first job. It was wow. a cashier. Uh, then from there, I think because of the good work I did, um, I was actually offered a job at a loss adjusting company as an accounts nice. clerk. And I was studying A levels. I was doing A level. Mm -hmm. accounting and economics and while at the loss adjusting company mm -hmm. I came upon this subject of insurance ah. uh, so I always knew of insurance but you just assume insurance was mm -hmm. all about selling policies <laughs> that was the extent of my knowledge of it uh, so when I got into the loss adjusting firm I started to read the reports mm -hmm. and realized that there were several disciplines that contributed to the insurance business mm. uh, so that caught my attention and I spent a year or two there, and then I got to Crossroads where I was offered a job at the, uh, I think it was called the Barbados Tourism um, Inc. I'm mm -hmm. not sure, I can't recall the name, uh, as an accounts clerk. Mm -hmm. And I was also offered a job at Caribbean Home Insurance uh, mm -hmm. by one of my very good friends, Peter Harris, uh, to work in the claims area. Mm -hmm. uh, so I opted to, uh, the insurance side seemed more excited and I opted to pursue the insurance side. And while being a claims officer at Caribbean Home, uh, one of the things I learned very early that if I wanted to actually pursue the insurance business, I needed to actually become very good at, at what I did. Mm -hmm. So if, if you look at it from the perspective of playing an instrument, as a clarinetist, I would have been a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. uh, because in those days, uh, Toro actually was was probably an idol for me uh, as a clarinetist in those days and mm -hmm. a guy called Shepard, both from Common Mare, by the way. <laughs> um, but I, I spent a lot of time playing music with Wonderful. some Common Marians, so that is how I developed that side of my, my skill set. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the rest was history. I, I was actually advised, if you're going to stick it, just study it and um, do the best you can. So that is how I got 
into the business. Nice. So where you are now, Jack, as opposed to where you would have started, what do you remember most about your first job? Because I, I, I heard you mention that you uh, were a cashier when you started. Mm -hmm. what, what, what was that like? Uh, exciting. Uh, <laughs> young star of the school, uh, working <laughs> in the hospitality industry. Um, I think uh, outside of being a cadet at school, um, I, I had a love um, to serve people. And maybe it came from how I was brought up in church and um, as a chorister uh, and basically just helping, being like what I would say a servant. A lot of people don't like that term. Mm -hmm. uh, but quite frankly, this job is about serving. All right. um, so I don't see myself as a master, I see myself as a servant. Mm -hmm. uh, you just give me a title, but I'm, I come to work every day to serve people. Uh, so. When I look back, uh, it is the desire to actually help people and serve people. And I find that to be the common thread uh, from my um, younger days to now mm -hmm. in terms of that is what drives me. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is what is co pretty consistent in terms of everything I do. Mm, interesting. And what would you say is the best piece of advice you've ever received throughout your career? <laughs> Uh, I would say a former supervisor of mine uh, told me, if you're going to stay in this business, you must study the business. Mm -hmm. You must learn the business. Don't be a flu. Uh, and in those days, you would hear a lot of stuff from um, colleagues and people within the industry. And how do you know if it is right or wrong? How do you know that it is correct? Uh, so I ensure that I pursue um, studying, and I know that you actually um, listed a whole bunch of things I did, mm -hmm. but I believe in continuous education. So mm -hmm. if I'm gonna do something, I must know for myself. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't go by hearsay, right? Well, that's really good, Paul. Now, as it relates now, we're gonna get a little closer to the home with your family, okay. all right? What would you say is one of your, your most memorable family traditions, something that you look forward to doing? Uh, I would say uh, there are two things. Uh, so for family that is overseas, I enjoy Christmas. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, I would set aside Christmas. I, I can mm -hmm. work through the entire year, but when it comes to Christmas, Give you a I Christmas. actually want to jet off and spend time with my dad. My dad is actually like a child when it comes to Christmas. And I actually like that mm -hmm. because I, I didn't grow up with him. Mm -hmm. uh, so to see him in that element is like, I become a little child again. Oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and then you enjoy the snow and that type of stuff. Oh, nice. uh, close at home, um, I like to enjoy a, a good football match. I'm mm -hmm. actually a Manchester United fan. All right, oh, boy. one of those. Um, <laughs> that is one side of it. But I also, um, fo I, I learn a lot from football. There are two sports I watch, football and F1. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can never that. understand why people watch F1, cars racing. And I only learned this as I get older, um, I think I, as I relax a bit more, I, I learn uh, some things that connect to either business mm -hmm. or life. So from a football perspective, I watch football initially mm -hmm. because like everyone, you are a fan and you want yeah. your team to win. But I then started looking at um, leadership. So I learn a lot about leadership from football and everyone. Sure. Um, so I know follow leaders in football, mm -hmm. not necessarily uh, the club. Mm -hmm. So Marino mm -hmm. is uh, my favorite leader. Mm -hmm. I'm now learning club. Uh, but mm -hmm. how do you get uh, high performing, celebrity, highly skilled mm -hmm. individuals to work together to achieve a common goal and not be selfish? That's right. Uh, so when I look at Manchester United and how the manager organized that team, mm -hmm. you will realize guys don't keep the ball like a lot of the English players, they actually pass it. Mm -hmm. yes. um, the teams that keep and try to dribble, they don't get too far, right? They don't. Uh, so that is what I learned from uh, football. F1, it is the strategy around mm -hmm. um, how Mercedes dominate. <laughs> mm -hmm. So course. there are a lot of lessons for business. For sure. Um, and I'm more, so in, in including enjoying, mm -hmm. Yeah, to your competition, um, I try and learn strategy and how you engage with teams and how do you manage high performing mm -hmm. or how do you achieve a certain level of performance and sustain it. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. I noticed you mentioned a bit about your family um, overseas or your dad. And let's bring it closer to here now and tell me a bit about your family here. So I'm married with a stepdaughter mm -hmm. uh, who is 16 going on 20. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, we actually went to school. My wife and I, we went to school together. Mm -hmm. uh, so she was actually my first girlfriend. All right. Uh, that I can't remember um, from school. And this is secondary school, mm -hmm. that is. Um, so we actually grew up and we actually grew apart because I am older, so I left school before. We went our own ways. And then um, on returning to Barbados uh, about six years, seven years ago, uh, we actually reconnected uh, mm. back up. So uh, she's my wife today. All right, man. Yeah. Congratulations. Talk, yeah, congrats. And talk about stickability, huh? Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> most of my friends would say, you know, um, we always like you for her, and mm. we always like her for you. So um, I think Providence just work it out that way. Uh, Wonderful. Life has a very weird way mm -hmm. of working itself out. So, so true. Well, as we get to learn more about your background, I want you to tell us about your immediate background. Um, that is the saxophone behind you. That's uh, right. <laughs> I want you to tell us uh, a bit about that. I know you have a love and a passion mm -hmm. for it, and it's poised right there in the corner. And how did you get started where that is concerned on that particular instrument? Right. So uh, I got into the saxophone, um, I would say, um, in the 90s. Mm. Uh, I played clarinet uh, for a very long time. Uh, so I actually, when I left school, uh, tried to join the police band in those days. Okay. Uh, the government didn't have enough budget. So uh, that is how I got into Haywoods. <laughs> uh, then after that, I joined the Barbados Defense Force. Nice. Um, so I served there for 10 years as a reserve. Yeah. Uh, so initially, I, I was an infantry soldier, and then I didn't like the idea of killing people. Uh, <laughs> and the good thing that came out of that was they decided to form a band. So what you know mm -hmm. as the Zouav, the Zouav, yeah, Zouav band, yes, the Zouav. Um, I probably was the second incarnation of the Zouav band in mm. terms of the traditional words years um, when I was a lad, uh, but when they actually reestablished the Zouab band, I was mm -hmm. actually part of that um, formation. So I played clarinet for about five mm -hmm. years, and, um, and in those days I would also play with the, what they call the Barbados Chamber Orchestra, mm -hmm. which was conducted by Dr. Christopher Atherley. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So names like Roger Gittins and these yeah. guys, I would have um, gotten to know these guys through playing. Uh, Roger used to play clarinet as well. And after the, the, um, the regiment, I actually got into a church band and realized that the clarinet really didn't carry the weight mm -hmm. um, as a band instrument per se, um, because it's not necessarily classical and blues. Mm -hmm. uh, so I actually needed a heavy instrument. That's where the saxophone came in. All right. Uh, so I got my first sax, uh, alto, and I um, got some lessons from uh, my mentor, my music mentor, uh, is a guy called Cortez Callender, mm -hmm. um, who was a leading clarinetist in the police band. So he actually helped me. He helped me with the fundamentals. And then I went on to Andre Woodvine mm -hmm. and got some more formal lessons about developing. Mm -hmm. And um, then Cortez would say to me, uh, Paul, you really don't need a teacher. You actually know a lot of the basics and fundamentals you need to practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's similar to work. You need to study That's it. and practice. Uh, yeah. So I basically uh, practiced the instrument and um, I, I was pretty awful initially. So you're in a band setting and there are guys who are pretty proficient mm -hmm. and you're, you're <laughs> trying to sweat it. And you, you, mm -hmm. Because I'm not a, I was never a jazz player. Um, I learned music through um, the formalities of it as, a, as it relates to reading and playing. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't play something unless it was written. Mm -hmm. So you can put a piece of music in front of me and I'll just play. All right. um, so that was the skill I developed. In terms of the ear, um, I didn't have that outside of playing in a band and here if you're off mm -hmm. or not, right? Out of tune. Uh, so that, that is something I realized needed some attention and time. And over time, I actually started to develop an ear. And any favorite um, genre of music that you like? Um, I'm a gospel guy. Nice. I, I listen to gospel music. Um, 
in any form. Uh, I guess it, it is. I, I mm -hmm. say to people I have a, a soft ear uh, because I learned classical music. Mm -hmm. So I had a really hard time and struggle with um, dub and calypso, believe though, because mm -hmm. to me it was harsh. Mm -hmm. um, and it took me a while to appreciate calypso. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the some some parts of calypso. Mm -hmm. So if you play a David Barada, oh yeah, yeah I, the groovy, um, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, a gabby, <laughs> and, yeah. All right, yeah. So, so in terms of how how does Paul Ennis spend a day off? What for you would be a typical or what would be an idyllic day off? Is there a day off? There's no, no day off. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, um, I, I had a boss uh, in the 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to call his name John Jones, uh, a mentor of mine. Uh, I spent the first 12 years uh, of this business with, with John Jones, mm -hmm. uh, a man that really helped me a lot, um, both in discipline, structure. Uh, so he corrected me when I needed correcting. Mm -hmm. He mentored and coached me uh, mm -hmm. when I needed mentoring and coaching. And he was a gentleman that I look up to uh, in terms of when I look at a professional, he was one of the men in Barbados that I said I wanted to be like him. Mm. And he was actually uh, one of the most qualified insurance executives as well. Uh, and so for me, uh, he, he was, he was um, instrumental um, in, in my development. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and we, we have some general fun questions we just want to ask where your likes are concerned so that people get to know you a bit more. <laughs> okay, correct. And um, in terms of like random simple stuff, in terms of phone apps, what, what, what is the favorite phone app you like to your use? Your go-to app. <laughs> so when I pick up my phone, I normally go to the news. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's, it's the news app, something <laughs> the news app then. Yeah, uh, BBC or... Um, CNN? I, I like to... No, BBC. Okay. I'd rather BBC. Uh, so we normally go to my phone apps. Uh, I go to TuneIn uh, Tune, mm -hmm. because I like to listen to music. Mm -hmm. uh, outside of that, Forza for the football of course, of course. updates. Uh, Manu is playing this afternoon, guys. By okay. the way. All right. We got it. Uh, <laughs> for sure. Uh, so I don't have an app. I don't spend a lot of time okay. on the phone. Uh, All right. And if you were to win, or win the lottery, rather, what is the first thing you think you would do? Um, first thing I would do is what I would advise anybody to do. I'll part the money. So I'll deposit the money. Mm -hmm. I'll make no decisions mm. um, for at least 60 days. Okay. Uh, but then what would I do with it? Mm -hmm. uh, outside of paying off debt, mm -hmm. I would then seek to uh, help my family, my immediate family, uh, siblings, mm -hmm. uh, to some limit. Mm -hmm. uh, and th there's nothing crazy at this point in time I would do with the money. <laughs> okay. Interesting. I, I, I like that though. Yeah, they for don't, sure. Don't do anything for 60 days because... Let it cool off, as yeah, they say. You, you win it the Tuesday, you collect the Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, Saturday yeah, the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let, your head, let your head cool off. Yeah, yeah I think correct. so. Because there'll think be so. a lot of excitement, I think so. right? So, and I mean, it, it, is a, it is a very good practice. Mm -hmm. um, so, when we all get paid, uh, some people just get excited and splurge the money. Mm -hmm. And then they have challenges with respect to their monthly commitments mm -hmm. or their family commitments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so the best thing to always do is um, pay your bills, mm -hmm. pay your commitments first. And if there's excess, well, you know what? Take 10% of that excess mm -hmm. and save it. Put it somewhere that you can't touch it. Put it somewhere where you don't have an ATM card mm -hmm. or debit card to access. Well and then you can probably have a little fun. But then I would then say uh, invest a portion of that in a simple like a mutual fund or something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, as you get older, you don't regret. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say this, I'm 54 today. I never th thought of 54. I thought up to 40. Mm -hmm. Because when I, when I was younger, uh, in my 20s, and I look at a 40-year-old, that person look old. <laughs> um, I hope well, everyone still see me changed. that way. Yeah, yeah, but the whole things have changed. Things have changed a lot. But what I've learned is that you do get old if you live long enough. Mm -hmm. And then the question is always, how did I manage 
what sure. I worked for or what was given to me for that period. Yeah. Mm. Any pet peeves? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> I would say my biggest, I, I like structure and organization. Mm. Um, I don't like chaos. All right. Uh, and so for example, if there was anything out of place right now, you guys wouldn't know, but it would actually disturb me in terms of structure, mm. symmetry. <laughs> so you're one of those persons then, it, when it comes to the office and the setting, like, oh, you know, mm -hmm. there's some people who have clusters on their desk. That's right. And they said that um, some people like chaos and they operate well in that circumstance. Some. Your, your table is always set up neat, it's always That's right. that kind of... Yeah, it, actually if you were to come in here without this equipment, uh, you will see no paper on my desk. Well, so everything in its place and a place for everything. Yes. yes. Right. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, and I, I know a lot of um, younger persons will be, will be watching this now, and um, what would you say is your definition of success? A, a topic we want to stay on for a bit and talk about. Um, because, you know, we want to hear what your side of things is, where advice is concerned. Mm -hmm. What is your definition of success? Uh, very good question. So